So we are talking about chapter 12, um, starting uh, at 1202 with this uh, particular lecture. We'll be talking about hematology, which is the study of blood cells, and cytology, which is the study of cells. We have learning objectives in each of these lectures. These are important for you to understand what I'll be testing about. So I do want you to go through the learning objectives uh, every time that we do have a, uh, that I am going over a chapter. Um, it is not necessary uh, for me to go over these learning objectives. Uh, I do feel it takes some extra time where uh, you can read through um, the learning objectives that I am expecting you to understand uh, from the chapter. So what is important uh, about your role in as a veterinary technician so that you make sure that when we are taking blood that we're getting valid results. They mean something. Um, in with, Within the in-house laboratory, that's the laboratory that you have in your clinic, you need to make sure that when you are sampling the animal that you are using proper sampling techniques, that you've got the right uh, spot that you need to sample, uh, that you're pre preparing the, the uh, correct sample that you want to test, that you're storing it um, correctly, that you know what instruments to use, and that you are able to follow quality control measures. So that every time you do a test, the, the same you will get the same answers uh, for that particular test. Not the same answers, but it's run the same way so that you know that the answers that you get mean something. Within a reference laboratory, um, if you are working there, you will have uh, the same issues. You need to know your proper uh, sampling technique and handling, uh, the type and the amount of sample that is uh, needed if you're setting this away, that you have good communication with the laboratory. They need to know where the sample came from, how you got it, what animal it belongs to, uh, and any other history that goes along with that. Um, you also need to know how do you uh, store that sample properly and transport it to the lab laboratory properly. Now, I know that most clinics are moving more towards uh, sending their samples away to reference laboratories. And there's some good things and bad things uh, about doing this. Um, one good thing is that you have experts that are looking at this. That's all they do all day long. And so they're really good at... Uh, uh, determining whether what the disease might be or uh, what they're looking at. Um, they're also really good at maintaining their machines or should be. Um, with a, uh, is keeping it in-house, it's nice to have those results very quickly. So that's one good uh, thing to have it in-house. Um, there are reference intervals that we will uh, have for each sample that you have that are species specific because every species has something slightly different from an animal with healthy animals. And we use intervals because healthy animals don't or every animal doesn't have exactly the same number of red blood cells, exactly the same number of white blood cells. So there's, there's a, a normal range and we want to make sure that the the sample that we're turning in is within that normal range veterinary reference laboratories each one is going to have some variations in those references based on their uh, equipment and so we want to make sure that we are paying attention to those specific reference intervals um, and not assume uh, b based on the numbers that we get, uh, that we understand what is normal, what is not normal. The laboratory needs to tell us that. So hematology values. Um, this is providing red blood cells, RBCs, white blood cells, WBCs, platelets, and plasma protein concentration. This is going to help provide diagnostic information and diagnose healthy and disease states. It also helps us to monitor response to therapy. If we have an animal that's in a disease state and we're making it better and they have better numbers, uh, that's a good thing. Um, it is important uh, to remember uh, that when we're looking at these values, again, we need to pay attention to how the sample was collected, make sure that that was done correctly, make sure it's sent correctly, that we're sending the appropriate um, tube in, and you will see that th this is a purple top tube or a lavender top tube, and that is really specific 
uh, color that we associate with doing a hematology, looking at individual cells. So a complete blood count, or a CBC, is uh, something that we were going to collect uh, in a 2 mil blood collection tube. Most often it's a, a somewhat small tube. We don't want to overfill it. We don't want to underfill it. We want to put in just the right amount. Um, after we collect it, we need to mix the blood. We don't want to mix the blood when we still have a needle in that tube because uh, that will get a chemical on that needle. Um, but we want to put blood in the tube and then invert it several times. And we want to make sure that we don't have any clots because if we have clots, that's going to clump the cells together and we're not going to get a correct count. Um, so we want to make sure that we're mixing the blood after collection, as soon as we collect it, uh, before we do any type of counting of uh, cells, uh, before we do a blood smear, uh, where we smear out the blood and look at individual cells, and before we process it with anything. A lavender top tube contains calcium EDTA. Calcium EDTA mixes with the blood at a certain um, concentration that's why you don't want too much or too little of blood in there and it keeps the blood's uh, blood from cells from clotting together from clumping together so a PCV so these are our letters that you're going to see when you get the um, results back a PCV stands for packed cell volume um, we might also look for a HCT or hematocrit and this tells us what percentage of blood uh, in that sample is um, red blood cell versus uh, serum. And when we look at a percentage, uh, that gives us an idea of do they have enough red blood cells to carry oxygen uh, to tissues. Also going to get a red blood cell count, hemoglobin concentration. So red blood cells are great, but if they don't have hemoglobin attached to them, they can't carry oxygen. Um, some other letters that you'll see that may not mean a whole lot to you um, right now, but do mean something when we're talking about uh, the red blood cells and how they're functioning. MCV is mean cell volume. How much uh, uh, fluid or oxygen can that um, cell contain or how big is it? Um, MCHC is mean corpuscular uh, hemoglobin concentration. How much hemoglobin is within that cell? RDW is the red blood cell distribution width. How wide is that cell? Um, and the size of the cell really does uh, matter because as red blood cells get older, they get smaller. And that tells us something. The platelet count. Platelets are little tiny pieces of um, plasma cells that help with clotting. And so we need to have an appropriate amount of platelets in our um, blood vessels in order to maintain clotting. White blood cell count and white blood cell differential. So there are a lot of different types of white blood cells. So having a, an overall count of white blood cells is important, but then also knowing which white blood cells we have and how what are the numbers of those white blood cells can really tell us a lot about what type of inflammation, what type of infection that this animal might be experiencing. The most valuable information or, uh, is the one where we get consistent results. Um, and a direct laser CBC machine um, gives us the proper measurements uh, in almost every case. And, and this is only true if you maintain your machine correctly and do appropriate quality control measures. So the machine is only good, as good as the way that it's maintained. So usual CBC values that we get are red blood cell hemoglobin content, uh, hemoglobin content of reticulocytes. Reticulocytes are red blood cells that um, are younger than normal, so they still contain their nucleus. Corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, uh, hemoglobin concentration distribution width, mean cell volume of reticulocytes, platelet volume distribution width, and platelet crit. Um, so that gives us a, a lot more information if we're using a direct laser. I can really measure those cells very specifically. Some other things that we're going to look at if we get a CBC um, would be a plasma protein concentration. And this is where we measure total protein. And the way that we do this is that into the red blood cells and white blood cells and the serum that does not contain any uh, cells. We remove the serum from the top 
of the of that spun down sample. So we have red, a uh, little bit of white cells, um, and then a yellowish tinged or clear fluid on top. That's the serum, and that we can measure the total protein on. And we use what's called a refractometer. Put a couple drops of the serum on this refractometer, and we can measure that measures the solids in the liquid, uh, and that will tell us how much um, we can look at urine specific gravity with this so we can measure this with urine and so this is what we will see when we look through this um, scope uh, and this tells us dog or cat specific gravity but over here on the right we see total plasma protein and this will help us measure how many solids are within that um, the other thing we can look at is a blood smear and this is a properly done blood smear where you're seeing kind of a, a cone here, which um, on the edge of this cone, this is called the feathered edge. And this feathered edge is where we have some broken cells. So here, C, is where we have these uh, somewhat broken cells. This is, a, this is uh, damaging to the cells, um, and it just indicates that we've spread it as far as we can. In between this feathered edge and the body, which is thicker and has uh, layers of cells, um, there is a spot where we can read and see individual cells. So this is where we're going to read and look at these differences in individual cells. You can see neutrophils here and a clump of lymphocytes here, and those are unusual. So th that's, and you can see individual red blood cells as well, and little platelets. So that's where we're, what we're going to do looking at a blood smear. The automated hematology anal uh, analyzers use a couple different ways to look at this blood um, as it goes through the, the machine. The light scatter method the, and the impedance method. Um, cells will scatter light as they go through this machine. Um, and there's a focused laser beam and red blood cells are counted and measured, then white blood cells are counted, and then white blood cells are, they try, the, it tries to look at these different white blood cells um, and get a basic understanding of um, how, as light passes through them, uh, what are they? Um, and then platelets are counted and measured as well. With impedance method, it uses somewhat the same idea. It's putting something through the cells to determine what they are, but it uses an electric current instead. Um, whenever we use these machines, they need to have uh, their species specific. So they have to have um, you tell them what species it is because it's going to read it differently because not every species has uh, cells that look like um, this as far as a neutrophil goes or this as far as an eosinophil goes. So if you're doing a cow versus a dog, uh, their eosinophils or their neutrophils are going to look a little bit different. So we need to tell the machine what it's looking at. So when we're talking about the red blood cell, we're not talking about just the numbers that we're seeing, but also what, is the, what does the red blood cell look like? And so the numbers are important. That's pack cell volume or hematocrit. And that tells us a, um, usually a percentage of what percentage of the blood total contains red blood cells. Um, also total red blood cell count can help, but then hemoglobin concentration, how much hemoglobin is in that cell so that we can carry oxygen to the body tissues. Um, so measuring hemoglobin is important, and the size of the cell will tell you um, how much hemoglobin it can hold. So here's an example of, this is a, think of this as a small glass, what we call a capillary tube, it's very small, um, and uh, this is about the, the the size it would be if you're looking at the screen. Um, what we're looking at is a percentage. So what we do is we put a, a little bit of blood and it starts out being all red and then we spin it down so that at the end of this tube we have the, the heavier material. In And that's all our packed red blood cells. In between this packed red blood cells and the plasma or serum is what we call the buffy coat. And the buffy coat is white blood cells. Um, and there are other things that can live in that buffy uh, coat as well, some things that we'll look at uh, later on, but this is the basic of what we're looking at. So when we talk about, you know, a percentage of pack cell volume, all we're really looking at is, um, and, and they make these scales for you to read them, um, is we're, we're putting 
the tube against this scale. We've got plasma at the top and the end of the, this is um, uh, a putty material that keeps the blood in that tube. This is open, but it's so small that it won't pour out because this is keeping it uh, just you just have to plug one side in order to keep it in. Think about if you take a straw in your drink and you plug over the um, the hole of the straw, you can lift that straw out of the drink and the, the water will stay in there until you remove your finger. So that's what this is doing here. Um, so this is what we're looking at and you can see that between the plasma and the end, about 50% of this is red blood cell. Okay, so that gives us a really good idea of how much of the blood, and that's a normal uh, reading. Anywhere from 35% to 55% is normal. So we're looking at that and uh, looking at red blood cell count. Um, it's very difficult to do a manual count, so we really need to look at um, uh, using a machine to do this. When we're looking at red blood cells, and we look at what we call indices, the measurements of those red blood cells, the, if we have decreased red blood cells, anything less than 35%, we're gonna call that anemia. But anemia can be due to a lot of different things. And so looking at the size of the red blood cell, uh, looking at the shapes of the red blood cells, that can help us to classify what kind of anemia uh, we're dealing with. It. Is it regenerative, meaning is the bone marrow making more of it? Is it non-regenerative? Those are really important things to, to understand. Um, so hemoglobin is the red blood cell protein that carries oxygen from lungs to tissues. Um, these uh, changes are usually proportional to hematocrit or PCV changes, meaning the number of cells uh, if that's decreased, it will obviously decrease the hemoglobin concentration, um, but also can be decreased if you have smaller red blood cells. So indices or measurements of the red blood cell can help us to know what's wrong with those red blood cells. If they're too big, that means they're young or new, and they're maybe not as good at carrying oxygen. If they're too small, that means they're old or broken. Um, and so that, again, they're not really good at carrying oxygen. So we need mature red blood cells that don't um, aren't too old to do their job. Uh, volume and color of the red blood cell are important to measure as well. Well, MCV is an indicator of average red blood cell size. MCHC is the average amount of hemoglobin in a specific volume of blood. And MCH is the average amount of hemoglobin in each red blood cell. So again, plasma protein concentration, we calculate um, by refractometry of plasma, tells us solids versus liquid, um, ba uh, very basically, and you should, be, should have used this in some way in your chemistry class. Uh, you want to evaluate for changes in color and clarity as well, because something that looks a little bit more yellow could be a problem, unless it's a horse. horse ha horses have a lot of yellow in their serum. Um, so we need to, to look at this uh, closely. So if this is a sample of um, blood, then what we're looking at is a plasma protein of about 7.5. So between the 7 and the 8, almost exactly. Um, so we're going to call that 7.5, and that's a normal plasma protein. If we have decreased packed red blood cells, so it's down here, and we're at about 20%, and we have decreased plasma protein, that means that uh, we have, we're losing blood somewhere. So we have a lot less blood, of, blood cells available and a lot less protein available. Those two things together can mean a lot. If we were looking at urine, um, this would be a different reading. We would look at this uh, urine, if say it's in a dog, it would be 1040 to what we call 1042 or 1.042. Um, and that would be normal um, for a dog. It is important that when we're looking at plasma protein, um, that, that when we're looking at uh, blood, that we at, also take a urine sample and look at, at that as well. And that we're going to talk about why that's important later. White blood cell count. Um, we're looking at a total white blood cell count with a hemocytometer. That's a um, or an automated hematology analyzer. That's the most accurate way to get a white blood cell count. However, um, it can be sources of 
errors. So uh, sometimes um, red blood cells can look like white blood cells because if red blood cells have nuclei in them, they will look like white blood cells. So an, uh, a hematology, an automatic hematology uh, analyzer can't differentiate between the two. That's why it's really important that you have a uh, good idea of what things look like and do a differential smear or a blood smear so you can um, look at the blood yourself and make sure that it is accurate. Uh, we can also get a kind of a white blood cell estimate by looking again at this really tiny tube and looking at the Buffy coat. If this is a certain percentage, then this is also a certain percentage of the whole. And if you have a really big Buffy coat, that means you have a lot of white blood cells and that you've got inflammation or infection going on somewhere. This is the way that we used to do it before we had uh, automatic he um, hemolyzers. Uh, this is not as accurate, uh, but you do need to learn how to do it. And this is called a Neubauer or leukotic count. And it, what we do is we put a uh, sample of the blood uh, into this special slide that has um, a divot in it that is a certain volume. So if we're looking at the same volume of blood on these grid grids, uh, and we look at one section of the grid, we can do an estimated count. Um, so this is something you will do. Um, next, we're going to talk about blood smears, coagulation, and testing, and cytology. We are going to talk about doing a blood smear. Um, this is a technique that you do need to learn. Um, and it is something that does take some practice, a lot of practice. And what we do is we take two slides, we take a drop of blood, and the size of the drop of blood really matters. We bring the slide back, uh, allow it to spread, and then spread it, do this blood smear. And you can see we have a feathered edge, we have a body, and in between the body and the feathered edge, uh, we have a counting area. We want to try to dry it quickly to prevent our um, red blood cell artifacts. Our artifacts are anything that uh, we cause to look different because we've done something wrong. Want to stain it within 48 hours, store it at room temperature, and when we ship it out for somebody else to read, we cannot ship it out. First of all, we don't want to stain it uh, if we ship it out because they will want to stain it differently. We also don't want to ship it out with anything um, with biopsy se specimens because the formalin that, that comes out of those jars will um, uh, damage those stains. All right, so here's what it looks like kind of close up. Here's the drop. We've pulled that back against the drop, allow it to spread and push it out forward. So we have our fat feathered edge, our body, and our counting area. Some other things we can look at. Um, an agglutination in a blood smear. So uh, red blood cells typically should not clump together in a normal animal, with the exception of cats cats and cows actually both of them uh, will get these co stacking coins that are called rouleau rouleau formation are red blood cell and chains that look like a stack of coins uh, those things um, stacked up um, are normal in cats and cows but not in other species agglutination is when we have irregular red blood cell clumps that should not happen uh, within um, normal blood. What that means typically is that we have uh, excess antibody binding. That means the immune system is recognizing these red blood cells as uh, foreign invaders and so is binding them together so that uh, macrophages can come in, recognize them as uh, problems, and eat them up. Uh, and this we will see in something called immune-mediated hemolytic anemia in dogs, um, where their own body attacks their red blood cells and causes them to become anemic. And this is what it looks like in a dog. This is a test where we're doing an agglutination test. This is normal. Um, this is uh, just blood with saline in it. Uh, and this is blood uh, that is exposed uh, to its uh, itself. So this is or actually blood that's exposed to saline and clotting. So this is a normal and this is, um, this is a uh, abnormal um, clotting. Platelets in a blood smear. Um, we, we should have platelets in the blood smear. Unfortunately, sometimes when we take blood, if we take too long to get the blood, uh, it will start to clot right away. 
as soon as you poke that uh, vessel, you're on a time clock. Uh, you need to get the blood out. And you need to uh, do it as gently as possible. Um, when we have platelet clumping, that can uh, cause the, our machine to say we have not enough platelets. So we need to look and make sure that we do have enough um, platelets for the animal to clot its blood during a procedure. So we look at the feathered edge um, and we want to look for this clumping of platelets together. If we see that, then we can say to our um, doctor that uh, we have normal platelets. They just were clumped, so the machine couldn't read it. And another thing we can see in the feathered edge are these these, these little worms live uh, in the blood vessels, and we can see them among the red blood cells. So we want platelets. Um, they do function in clot formation. Uh, we can estimate how many platelets we have. We should see about 6 to 15 per oil immersion field. Oil immersion field is 100 times uh, uh, magnification. Um, we can get it through an automated cell counter, but again, if it says it's low, we need to look at a blood smear. Um, and this really has a lot to do with sample handling. If you are not mixing up your blood enough, if you don't get it quickly enough, um, you have a an animal that is struggling uh, during the, the blood draw, those are all things that can cause cl uh, clumping. If we truly do have not enough or too much platelets, too many platelets is called thrombocytosis. Platelets are known as thrombocytes. So thrombocytosis means too many platelets. Thrombocytopenia, anything penia means less than. Uh, thrombocytopenia means we have not enough. Uh, platelets, just like anemia kind of thing. All right, so morphology of red blood cells. Morphology means the shape of, the body shape. This is what you would see in a dog or a cat, a round spherical kind of donut. Um, it, it is thicker on the outside, thinner in the middle. You'll notice there are no nuclea uh, and nuclei in the center. They are without nuclei, as opposed to um, a llama will have uh, more um, elliptical, and then a reptile or a bird will actually have elliptical red blood cells with nuclei in the center. You know, that's just different species. Red blood cells, poikilocytosis, great word, poikilocytosis just means the different shapes. Um, if you have red blood cells with different shapes in your blood smear, this can indicate problems. So the shape is poikilocytosis. There are different types of shapes, and we're going to go through those um, briefly, but what I'd like you to do is look these up so you can actually see what these different shapes are. So take these words, copy, paste them, type them into your Google browser, uh, look under images. Okay. Um, so leptocytes are also known as target cells. Guess what they look like? They look like targets. They have a, a, a bullseye in the center. Stomatocytes uh, look like they have a mouth. Echinocytes look like an echidna or a hedgehog. An echidna is kind of like a, a hedgehog. Uh, echinocytes are spiky. Acanthocytes are spiky but in a different way. Schistocytes look like they are sheared across so that they are broken. And spherocytes look really round. Um, they don't have that center uh, uh, that is missing. Red blood cells um, with oxidative damage, what we'll see is uh, anything that is oxidated, um, cells that are oxidated are dying. So anything that causes oxidative damage uh, will cause these cells to look like eccentrocytes, so they'll be off-center. Pycnocytes, um, they'll be smaller than normal. They may have Heinz bodies, which means they have an, a um, part of their nucleus did not exit the cell completely, so it'll be pinched off um, and a little bit of purple. It's stained purple. The nucleus stains purple, so you'll see a little bit of purple on the um, on the body of the red blood cell. Might see uh, polychromasia, which means that um, many colors. Uh, so uh, when we see cytoplasm that is more basophilic or blue, more more blue than normal, um, that indicates that we have a younger cell, uh, and that can be an, um, a problem. There are also erythrocytic parasites, or parasites that um, go after the uh, red blood cell 
specifically, and one of these is called Mycoplasma hemocanus, um, and typically need a little help looking for that. So a laboratory, um, somebody who works in the laboratory is um, often able to see that. A um, lot of differences uh, with the cells with species. That's why it's important to let the machine know what species of blood uh, that you're putting into it. When we're doing a differential um, white blood cell count, it means we're doing a blood smear and we're looking at at least 100 leukocytes. And you can tell leukocytes are these white blood cells versus the red blood cells. So we're looking at 100 of these cells and we're telling what types um, of those 100 cells are uh, neutrophils or eosinophils or basophils or lymphocytes or macrophages. So we're going to look, or monocytes, I'm sorry, not macrophages. Mo macrophages live in tissue, monocytes live in the blood. Um, so I'm going to go through these. These are segmented neutrophils. You can see that um, they have really uh, um, very twisted, it's actually twisted, uh, nuclei. And it's all twisted up. And so it's creating kind of a weird shape. If the cell is young, it'll have a band. It's not twisted yet. So as the cells age, they get more twisted. These are neutrophils that are banded. And there's a big difference between these two. Here's a segmented one. Here's a banded one. Uh, I think of a little girl with a hair band. So what these are, these little banded neutrophils, are they are young neutrophils that the body has sent out because there aren't enough older neutrophils to fight the fight. So these are child soldiers uh, that are coming in if we have an overwhelming infection. So when you see banded neutrophils, they're still neutrophils, but they're coming in because we don't have enough. <clears throat> it's a, it's a, an infection that's been going on a little bit longer, it's, or it's a little bit more intense, and it can indicate a, a bigger problem. We have an eosinophil here and a basophil here. Um, some more eosinophils, a basophil, a neutrophil, lymphocytes. So with lymphocytes, they are round, they are fairly small, um, and they have most of their cytoplasm is made up of nucleus. Okay, And then a monocyte is going to be much bigger than a, a neutrophil, and it's going to have little vacuoles in it because it's, get, it's getting ready to eat um, bad things. Some abnormal cells that you might see circulating in the blood, mast cells. Mast cells are cells that release histamine, and they're always abnormal. We might see in neoplastic hemopoietic cells. These are cells that are um, uh, replicating. So if you see mitosis, which you've uh, probably seen in beginner biology, a cell replicating itself, that's abnormal. You should never see that in circulating blood. Broken or smudged cells, so cells that are broken or smudged in some way, you have not prepared the sample appropriately, um, or poorly preserved cells. When we have coagulation, um, it's, a, it's a complex system that happens within the body. So we have to have coagulation so that we don't bleed out all the time uh, because we're ha constantly having damage to our blood cells or our blood vessels throughout our body, throughout our tissues. So first we have hemostasis. Hemostasis is when we have our uh, platelets kind of clot together. Um, and then so we have a, a tissue damage that sends out a, a, a a signal for platelets to come together, and that's called primary hemostasis. And then we have what's called a coagulation cascade, when there are a lot of factors. Each factor um, promotes another factor, so it's kind of like dominoes. So you have to have one after the other after the other, and that's a, called secondary hemostasis. Um, the coagulation factors have to do with a lot of plasma proteins. And these plasma proteins bring in fibrin, Fibrin um, is a kind of a cartilaginous subject, uh, su um, cartilaginous um, uh, meshwork, um, it's little little tiny pieces of cartilage, teeny teeny tiny, can't see them. Um, but this fibrin meshwork stabilizes that plug. But then we have this great big plug globule of um, scar tissue, and and we have to uh, kind of dissolve that so we don't have clots hanging out in our blood vessels all through the body. 
So plasmin comes in, it's called fibrinolytic, it breaks down the, the big clot, dissolves the clot, and leaves a little bit of scar tissue to heal that uh, tissue. Um, we can test for various issues within that pathway. So if we have a coagulation um, uh, problem during this coagulation um, sequence, uh, we can test uh, with a blood test um, or some different techniques uh, that will help us determine what, where we're having a problem during that pretty um, massive sequence. Uh, we're going to cover that a little bit later um, when we're talking in anatomy and physiology because it's pretty um, substantial. Cytology is the microscopic examination of cells. We can look at cells that are exfoliated or rubbed off of tissues or come off of tissues or uh, cells that are accumulated in fluid. Um, a lot of times we can do a non-invasive diagnosis looking at the cells. Um, we can look at inflammation, neoplasia, and in some cases will give us definitive diagnosis. The limitation of cytology is that we're just looking at the cells. We're not looking at the structure or the architecture of the cells. If we have a solid mass, we can take a fine needle aspiration, which means we're sticking a needle and getting some of those cells into that needle. Um, sometimes we can aspirate those cells using a syringe, and sometimes we can just stick the needle in a number of times and collect cells within the, that needle. Um, we're going to need a, spreader sli a slide and a spreader slide, and uh, we're going to smear one slide over the other, and then we'll have um, cells on both slides. If we have fluids, um, we're going to, again, uh, capture those fluids uh, with needle and syringe and make sure we get those on a slide um, and prepare it appropriately for analysis. So here's an example of if we have some sort of um, cellular material, fluid, uh, something soft, um, typically we can put a little drop on a slide and smear them so that we have um, similar two smears. You can look at one and send one away. When we stain these slides, it's important that they are uh, stained appropriately. And that's why a lot of times, or most of the time, when we're sending these slides to a laboratory, we're not going to stain them. We're going to allow the laboratory to stain them. So we're going to um, smear them, dry them, put, um, put them in uh, specific slide holders, and send them appropriately to a lab. So there are different types of stains, and each one has advantages and disadvantages um, based on um, what you're looking for. Um, there are other tests that we can do on specifically fluid. Um, we can do immunophenotyping by flow cytometry, which means we can look specifically at the type of cell and see what it is, or a DNA-based testing. When we submit these samples to a reference laboratory, it's really, really important that you do it appropriately and, and properly. If you mess up on this test, they will not do it, and then you're going to have to collect the sample from that animal again. You're going to have an upset animal, and you're going to have an upset client, and so you want to get it right the first time. So always ID the, the patient appropriately, um, either their name or their number, if they're part of a herd, um, their species, um, put in their age, their sex, give a brief history, re any relevant examination data, and typically your veterinarian will put, um, tell you what to put on there, uh, previous therapy uh, and test results, and any differential diagnoses you, you might have. Uh, sample data, you're going to put where did you pull this sample. So here's a, a picture of a cat. This is only part of the form. Uh, the, uh, down lower in the form, this is the dorsal, so there's the back. Um, the, um, you'll also see one that is ventral, um, so you can appropriately mark, make sure you get right or left correct, uh, where that um, lesion was found, and then describe it as much as possible. Ears. Uh, we do a lot of ears in this business, and so um, uh, do a lot of ear swabs. And so ear swab is simply taking a, an, um, a Q-tip or a cotton swab, um, putting it in the ear, and then um, putting a small amount of it on a slide. Um, when we have mites or bigger creatures like this, uh, we're going to take some mineral oil and mix that in on the slide, put a cover slip on that, uh, and we'll see these guys swimming around. If we have something 
smaller, like an ear infection, we're going to do a thin smear. So we're just seeing one layer of cells uh, and we're going to stain it and look at it. Uh, this is a stain of an ear swab uh, with some white cells in it. That means we have severe inflammation and infection inside the ear, which is unusual, and then a lot of bacteria um, and then some waxy substance. This is yeast, Malassezia yeast. So this is a yeast infection. There is some bacteria in here as well and a lot of waxy exudate. Um, we're gonna, we also want to use an otoscope, which is the tool that we use to look in the ear. Uh, when we do um, otic cytology, uh, a lot of times we're doing ear, uh, air drying before we stain it, because if you stain it with uh, moist exudate on it, you're not going to get this. Uh, it'll, it'll all come off the slide. Um, and then we typically will use oil immersion lens. This is the 100 times magnification. This is a uh, 10 to 40 times magnification, so you don't need to use it for bigger um, critters in the ear. If you have any questions, please shoot me an email or let's discuss it in class.